Hello and welcome to another episode of the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. Uh, we've got a great show for you today. We've got some really interesting news uh, this morning. It's Friday. We're recording the show a little bit later in the week. Uh, and then fortuitously, the Mustang Mach 1, uh, that name, that car, it's coming back for the 2021 model year. Uh, that news broke this morning. So we're going to get into that a little bit. Uh, but joining me today uh, on the phones, as always, during this time of quarantine, is senior editor for All Things Green, John Snyder, and associate editor Byron Hurd. Guys, uh, what kind of coffee are you drinking this morning? I'm drinking an espresso cafe de Cuba. And uh, actually, sounds good. Pretty delicious. Um, I had one sort of later in the morning yesterday and had okay. trouble getting to sleep last night because of it. Uh, wow. So it's some powerful stuff. I I could drink an espresso at like 7.30 with dessert. It's no problem with me. Uh, uh, this, um, this is actually like regular coffee from Nespresso, like from the... Oh, I see. It's like a Keurig machine, but a different brand. I have one of those or one like that. Yeah. It's it's pretty great. Uh, Byron, what are you drinking, man? It's 9.24. I'm, I've got some sludge that started as green tea and... Got a bunch of stuff thrown into it. John's seen me make this at my desk before. It's probably nah. terrifying to him, uh, but it works. It's just a big, big pile of tea and some water kind of sprinkled on it. Sounds good. Sounds good. I've uh, I've got plain old Folgers, but uh, hey, it's working. It's doing the trick. And let's get into the show because I'm sure uh, everybody listening at home is much more curious about that. We're going to lead off with the Mach 1, break that down for you, head over to the site. We've got the news uh, breaking that down, and then uh, one of our contributors, Joe Lorio, handled uh, kind of a sidebar just to look back at what the meaning of the Mach 1 is. So you got to check that out, but we're going to break it down for you so you can hear it on your phone, uh, whatever you're doing this weekend, maybe running some essential errands or doing some yard work. Uh, reviews. I've been in the Toyota Highlander, <clears throat> excuse me, and the Toyota Corolla. Uh, that's actually, guys, I'm calling an audible here. It's not on the run sheet, but I went and got some takeout last night, and I kind of want to talk about it because it's the first stick shift I've driven in who knows when. <laughs> so it was nice. fun. A lot of fun. It's bright blue, too. So there's that. Uh, John was in the uh, Outback Touring and the Forester, and Byron is in the Gladiator. We're going to run through those reviews. I'm going to play a little bit of trivia, a uh, new segment I kind of thought up last weekend while I was um, actually cleaning a bathroom. So um, I was listening to a podcast where they did trivia, and I thought, we should okay. try that. So <laughs> I'm going to torture you guys with that. Uh, we've got a couple of quick debates on best cars or cars movie during quarantine. It could be a movie car of like Pixar cars or just any car movie. Uh, the Mach one, uh, that lends itself to a couple actually. And then best orphan car brand. And finally, we will spend your money. We've got a bit of a buffet here. Uh, a spend my money comes from a gentleman from, uh, the Netherlands. So like, you really got to like save this podcast, break it up listen to it all the way through but let's go back to Mach 1. Uh, I'm excited this is a really cool name uh, the car itself sounds pretty interesting. Uh, Ford is putting out some teasers essentially it's like spy shots but they're not spy shots they're just camo shots of the car doing some testing uh, which looks pretty good it's uh, they're sort of billing this as the highest version of the 5 liter V8 Mustang. The epitome of it is one of the words they used uh, the most capable. So they're really kind of giving a very specific targeted approach for what the Mach 1 is going to mean. It's definitely a play, like my takeaway here, and I want to hear what you guys think, is this is a hardcore play at the Mustang enthusiasts. <clears throat> so if like the Mach E seemed like blasphemy to you, <laughs> the Mach 1 is naturally aspirated, 5 liter, wampin V8. This is for you. So it's kind of a way to bring it back. You know, it's, you know, if one is polarizing, well, the other one can be polarizing in the opposite direction, I guess. No moderation here. So that was my take immediately, the way they kind of rolled it out. Obviously, I can't wait to drive it. Um, frankly, a, a naturally aspirated V8. I think this thing is going to sound amazing. Uh, we don't have any specs so far. Um, there's a lot of implications about this, too. You know, what does this mean for the Shelby GT350? Byron, you were mentioning uh, that... That future is, they haven't really said anything. And trying to read the tea leaves, you know, we've been speculating. Um, and there's always a bunch of different flavors of Mustang. But right now, super psyched. Great way to wake up on a Friday morning with news like this. Go to you, Byron. What do you think? Well, so I'm 
I've owned uh, this generation of Mustang. I had a 2015 for a year. Um, and I'm looking at this as like kind of a piece of perfection if they can if they can pull it off. Like this is one of those cars where they've always been like 95% of the way to pretty much the perfect Mustang. And they've been kind of dancing around that last 5%. And I'm hoping that this is going to be it because I'm looking at this like it, the, it has those the kind of classic round headlight shapes in the or fog light shapes in the grill that actually on this prototype look like they might actually be air intakes or something like that. Kind of like a Hellcat, which I love. Um, f feed that beast. It's a great engine. And uh, I'm excited about it. I, I, the rumors coming out around the GT350 came from dealer ordering guides that weren't showing it after the, I believe it was the 2020 model year. So I don't know whether these two cars could coexist. They are different enough, I think, to get away with it because... You can have, you know, the the five liter Mach one as like the attainable track car, and then the GT three fifty is more of a halo, and then the GT five hundred is, you know, the super snake type car. That works, I think, in my mind. I, it might be slicing the it a little too thin, but I think those cars could coexist, and I it would be a, really cool to see the family that large and with that many capable fun cars. John, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, it, looking at it, it looks like, um, you know, the, those air intakes up front, you know, that just going to ring the most out of this engine. And that it has, is just such a sweet uh, engine, that 5-liter V8. It's, it sounds good. It pulls uh, really hard from the bottom to the top of the rev range. Um, Whatever they can do to, you know, sort of give that what it needs to see its full potential is awesome. Um, and then, yeah, the Mustang, you know, uh, the Mustang proper, the stock, you know, base Mustangs that you would get, uh, the factory Mustangs, um, have been inching closer and closer and closer and closer to being actually good on a track uh, for a long time. And, um you know, if they give it some more, uh, you know, better suspension, um, you know, the right wheels and tires, this thing could just actually slay on a track. It'd be so much fun. Um, yeah, a, a, a good Mustang on a track is a wonderful thing. And, and, uh, if they, if they nail this, it's just, it's going to be sweet. What I think is interesting is the Camaro has been so track capable for, you know, the last few years. It's, in some ways, I think the Camaro has been more precise than the Mustang, whereas the Mustang has been more of a raw, visceral experience, which if you're a great driver, you might want that. Um, the last time I actually sort of tracked both of these, we did a compare quite a few years back, but then more recently, I still found this to be somewhat true. The Camaro could cover up for your mistakes a little bit more, whereas the Mustang is an amazing car, but if you're not quite as good, you, you know your mistakes are going to show let's put it that way um but yeah uh random mach one trivia it was in the rockford files i did not know that um but yeah i mean i those air intakes up front i mean we're kind of assuming they're air intakes uh i think that that looks pretty awesome um so we'll see i mean do you guys have a favorite generation of mach one this was a a like a name that was actually used somewhat, you know, ubiquitously um, throughout the different Mustang lineage. Is there, you guys have a favorite generation? You know, I don't know about how good it was to drive, but I, I just love the way the first one looks. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know that that was the best driving one, but I haven't driven any Mach ones. So, okay. Yeah. I haven't driven any either, but, um, Going by looks, I'm going by the Yeah, yeah. I mean, hey, that's that's totally reasonable, actually. Uh, <laughs> how about you, Byron? I kind of like the, the 2003, 2004, but that was kind of, like, those were formative years for me as, like, a, an automotive enthusiast. Like, that's when I was getting into buying cars and stuff like that, like, when I was actually, like, learning how to be a financial disaster when it comes to vehicle purchases. <laughs> um, but, like, uh, I, was, I was actually talking about this with Greg earlier, just that the competition orange on that new edge mustang so like 
it just worked. Like I, I, I never really loved that body style at the time, but it's grown on me over the years, even though it's effectively still a fox underneath. They did so much with it. They made it look so modern. And in those bright colors, they just really popped. And I think that and with the bullet revival they did right around the same time were just really cool for what they were. And I don't know. It's got it's just a it's it's that little soft spot that's never gonna go away. I actually kinda like the like early 70s Mach ones. I think, you know, 70, 71, 72, 73, those were good looking cars. It was like yeah, I think they really are. Yeah, I mean it's it was like a different, like really roided up version of Mustangs. Um they were in different like I remember they were in a lot of movies at that time too. I was just I fell down this total rabbit hole looking at the I am uh, what do you call it? IMC DB uh, oh, car yeah. database yeah. of movies. And I'm like, Oh my God, I can't believe how many movies this was in. Um, but yeah, I haven't driven any of these, but from a design standpoint, I love that one. The 69, 68, 69 one was certainly iconic. Um, yeah. Just cause that really sort of set the, like the tone, if you will, 69, not 68. Um, yeah, and Byron, like you, I'm kind of partial to the 0304 model as well. I mean, that had that 4.6 liter uh, V8 that was just, you know, really amazing. One of my neighbors has one, um, and you could just hear it rumbling at night when, you know, he rolls around the neighborhood. And I think in some ways that's like what heightened my awareness of <laughs> remembering the Mach 1, you know, because they actually haven't used it. And by the time this comes out, it'll have been 17 years. So. You know, that's, that's a while, you know, and I think my sense too, is they're going to probably let some of these Mustang variants fade away too at the moment. Like that's always been the playbook. Like we're going to bring the bullet in or we're going to bring the, uh, the boss 302 in, then we're going to take it back out. You know, then we'll bring, you know, we'll play up one of the Shelby's and that'll be the, like the flag, the standard bearer, if you will. Um, you know, the flagship sort of is a moving target too for the Mustangs, but yeah, this is good news. This is um, exciting news. It's summer here, so hey, seems like a good car to cruise around. Uh, cruise around in uh, a couple summers away, maybe. Yeah, Ford has a really good way of uh, paying fan service to you know different time periods. You know, depending on <clears throat> when you started driving or the cars you remember. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I remember when the when the boss the the new air quote boss 302 came out that was you know such a big deal and that was that was a fantastic car um but you know all the people who remembered the boss were you know into that and then you know, now the mach one you know just serves people like throughout time and i do i do like the the idea of um you know bringing one back for a little bit and then that name is gone again uh, it make just you know don't clutter the field with it just um have one really good mustang at a time and have it have its own personality i don't think there's any real danger for this just because everybody like who loves the mach 1 will know what it is but mach e mach 1 that cause any heartburn for you guys no no i'm good cool. i'm good with it okay. i like the all right there you go <laughs> well we're, we're gonna get it's to it. that later in the show actually uh spend my money is a there's a mach e question so yeah, not bad, not bad. Uh, so total random side note, you remember the boss 302. I remember like when they brought it back the last generation, cause I interviewed Parnelli Jones at Laguna Seca. Uh, it, he was just talking about that car and like his involvement in the development. And it was out at Pebble beach and it was at like 6 AM. And it's just like, you remember like formative things you do in this business. And that's pretty hard to like forget stuff like that, you know? dude was like 70 he had crystal clear blue eyes was just like when you think of like race car drivers guys you would want driving a mustang at its limit but also being totally in control of their like emotions and surroundings like that's the guy you know like yeah. <laughs> you know you're not supposed to be nervous when you're driving a car really fast or something you know you're supposed to be excited but just the you know the ice cool fighter pilot demeanor, you know, all that stuff. So anyways, I digress. That was a total indulgent side story, but it just came to mind. And yeah, let's talk about some of the cars we have been driving. Um, John, why don't we segue over to you, Forrester, 
and the Outback. Um, compare them for me. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, I I started by these were both sitting in my driveway. I started by diving into the size of them. Um, I always think of the Outback as being, you know, a segment larger, but really, you know, on the inside, they're they're very similar in on paper. Um, they're within like w- one or two cubic feet of each other, max, uh, max cargo space and, and, you know, similar, uh, passenger volume. Um, <clears throat> uh, the different, the biggest difference in them is just how they're sort of laid out, how, th- how that space is used. Um, the Outback, you know, it's, it's, it's a longer vehicle, um, so it's got that longer load floor, even though the cargo area is sort of the same. Um, the Forester is taller, um, but that that length also uh, plays into how they drive. Uh, the Outback, you know, feels more uh, car like, and you know, it, it, it drives like a legacy. Um, it's more stable on the highway with that it, the wheelbase. I think about three inches longer than the than the Forester. Well, the Forester can be a little twitchy uh and whatnot um the biggest thing though is is both of these with the uh the 2.5 naturally aspirated engine is uh it's a way better fit for the forester that the outback you know they're only like a few hundred couple hundred pounds um different uh the outback's a couple hundred pounds heavier but man it feels a lot more sluggish uh, than the Forester. I mean, the for- Forester doesn't feel quick, but it doesn't feel, I don't know, you're not <laughs> like trying to uh, Barney rubble it with your feet, trying to get it to go. <laughs> um, the Outback, man, it it just takes its sweet time getting up to speed. If you do anything more than, you know, uh, one third throttle, it just does not respond. Um but that said, you can get it with the with the two point four turbo, which is which is really nice, and that's a really good fit for the for the Outback. But I, I like um, that two point four turbo. I think that really really makes a difference in Subarus. Yeah, and I miss it. I miss it in the Forester. The Forester was so good with the turbo. Uh, it, it was really fast. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Those are my initial impressions. Um, yeah, I'm diving a little deeper into everything in a in a comparison that I'm writing up, um, so that will be available soon. Um, but yeah, if I were gonna live with one, geez, uh, I would r- probably rather live with the the Outback, uh, even with um, even if I am stuck with the the uh, smaller engine or the less powerful engine, um, just because the the rest of it is so nice. It feels higher quality. The tech is better. Um, you know, I think it drives a little better. Um, and just the footprint of that rear cargo area is more useful for day to day. If you're not, as long as you don't have anything super tall back there, you're fine. You can pack a bunch of groceries. Uh, anything, you know, that's less than like two feet tall is going to fit fine. Um, you know, covering that entire footprint in the cargo area in the Outback, and you can pack a ton in there. Now, you did an unconventional test, if I recall. I think you tried putting your son in the back of these vehicles, uh, <laughs> according to a tweet. Which one did he fit better in, if he went into both of them? I don't know. Um, he uh, he could disappear under the cargo thing of the uh, the cargo cover of the uh, Outback. You know, he, yeah. he was just gone. Wow, okay. <laughs> But yeah, no, I was I was outside, you know, sort of measuring things um, when when he and my wife got home from my mother in law's, and he's just like, oh, you know, you got these open, I'm going to check them out. <laughs> so he helped me out there for a little bit. <laughs> very cool, very cool. Um, I would all I obviously I wasn't a part of this comparison, but I always tend to land on the Outback. It's just it's a car that I am a big fan of. Uh, I like the dynamics. I like how it looks. I like the Forester. If I was in the market for a crossover in that space, it's in the top five I would, you know, recommend. Uh, yeah, if I didn't have a kid and, and dogs and, uh, you know, have to drive up north all the time, um, and if I lived in the city, the, the Forester would be, would be the way to go. Um, but just the amount of 
sheer space in the outback. Um, even though they're they're like the same in terms of cargo space, in terms of volume, uh, they're essentially the same. Uh, it's just more useful in the outback. I like the wagon vibe too. So it's just there's something about it. Byron, tell us about the Gladiator, but real quick, Forester or Outback? Uh, Outback. Okay, all right. Yeah, so, definitely Outback. All right, fair Didn't enough. Have to think about that very long. <laughs> um, yeah, so the the Gladiator, I've, I've, I've had mixed feelings about the Gladiator. I like it uh, on spec, and I've driven it a couple of times, but mostly off-road up until this week. Um, so this is the first time I really had a chance to like take it on the highway. Um, I did a video taking the roof off, which was super easy to do, even without having any extra tools. Uh, you just need like an extra set of hands. It's a lot of fun to drive that thing around without the top on. Had a fun interaction with the Metro Detroit bus driver, who was very amused by the fact that I was driving around what he called an $80,000 Jeep without any doors on it. It wasn't $80,000, but it was a fun moment. Um, I really, I really fell in love with that thing, uh, having it for the for the week. the uh, The footprint of it is deceiving. I actually, I pulled up a comparison just to see how big it is uh, versus the Ranger and the Colorado, the Tacoma. And on paper, it, like it's narrower than the Colorado, which isn't surprising. The Colorado feels huge, uh, but it's about the same size as the Tacoma and the Ranger, kind of give or take here and there on some of the dimensions. But it feels so much smaller. It actually feels like a compact truck. And especially inside, because it is effectively a Wrangler on the inside and there's not a ton of interior space. But the doors are tiny. It, it, if, you, if you're like me and you have a house with a narrow driveway or you have a, a narrow garage space, getting in and out of that truck next to another vehicle, I wasn't like concerned about digging the doors on the Challenger and stuff like that. It's actually a much more practical size and shape than its dimensions suggest. And I found that very charming because in my mind, it's maybe the least practical of the midsize trucks, even though the numbers are competitive or even superior in some cases. It just, when you look at it, you're like, eh, that's a toy, that's not a truck. And, but driving it like, I was looking and I was like, man, I own a Wrangler, it's an older two-door, and I could easily see myself replacing it with a Gladiator down the line just for the extra utilitarian value of it. The only real hiccup is the cost. It is an expensive truck. It's not an $80,000 truck, but it is an expensive one. I mean, the one I had the window sticker on that Rubicon was $61,000 and change. That's a lot of money for any truck, let alone a, a small and mid-sized truck. And I could, I could not see myself buying one of those new. I priced out some lower ones, some sports and sport S's, and you can get into them for, you know, thirty-five, forty thousand dollars $40,000 with kind of the options you would want. And that's realistic, I suppose, especially considering what people spend on trucks these days. But, like, for me, I'm like, I'm looking at it, I'm like, man, this would be a great little utilitarian vehicle if it weren't for the Jeep Premium, which you just can't. You can't avoid that. It's real, and even for used ones, the resale value is insane. But like, I could do things with it that I can't do with my Wrangler. Like, my neighbor put a grill out that he was getting rid of, and it was like around the corner. I probably could have just walked over there and grabbed it, but I was driving home from buying groceries, and I saw the grill, so I just pulled up, threw it in the bed, drove away. And with the Wrangler, that would be a chore. Obviously, a pickup's more convenient for that kind of thing. And I could just, I could so see myself owning it, it would fit my lifestyle perfectly, but I couldn't justify the cost. Yeah, it's, um, well, uh, two things. One, if you need a lawnmower and you need to swing by, let me know. I've got a, <laughs> I've actually got two of them uh, and I have two snowblowers. So next time you have a gladiator Ooh, or snowblower. anything. Snowblower, okay. One's electric. That's that's the one that's sort of up for sale. Just because I don't really trust the like the whole corded system. I have a long driveway. I don't. That's not how I want to leave this world. Is being electrocuted. <laughs> um, I digress. I'm curious, Wrangler or Gladiator, though. Um. Well, if you're gonna if you care about off roading, then the Wrangler is the only answer because the Gladiator is too much vehicle for trails in my mind. Any, I mean, if you're gonna off-road in a mid-sized truck, then the Gladiator is the one you want for that because it's the best at it. But if you want to off-road, period, 
get a Wrangler, look at a new Bronco, that kind of thing. They're the short wheel bases, the the shorter overhangs are far superior for that kind of thing. And I've I've off roaded this Wrangler and other Wranglers many times, so like my comfort level with them is incredibly high. And even I think the Gladiator is just too much extra truck for that kind of thing. Um, how about how about you, John? Just curious. Wrangler. Yep. Um, I've asked you this like yeah, this five is... times on the podcast, but <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, one thing I'm going to do with it is is go off roading for sure. If I if I have a Jeep, anything with a Jeep badge, um, and yeah, that that length, the extra length of the Gladiator. Um, you know, I we we off roaded in it, um, and and like you mentioned, Byron, uh, the being like the the it feels like a small truck when you're looking at it. That actually really helped on the trail. You could see the corners of the vehicle. Uh, I knew I wasn't hitting anything. I just wasn't sure if I was going to, you know, hit that breakover angle. Uh, but yeah, Wrangler. Yeah, I um, I would go with Wrangler as well. I was super psyched when the Gladiator came back. Um, we were really psyched to test it at our first comparison test, like full-scale comparison test. It was about this time a year ago northern michigan it barely lost we're talking like decimal points to the ranger my sense is if we redid that the, the gladiator would win i think we dinged it on more for price than i think in hindsight we probably would have i don't know that was a year ago you don't rewrite history my sense no, is I, th it, I think i think the ranger still stands really I okay think was, yeah fair enough okay i'm standing by those stand by <laughs> well i i too am standing by it i wrote a column telling everybody how the, we got it right <laughs> but i am kind of re-autopsying it a little bit like well i don't know man well I, we can always do it again you want to do it again that's true. i'll do it again <laughs> yeah i think we get a lot of people to show up for that we could do it outdoors <laughs> everybody pitches their tent six feet apart and away we go um, yeah, I did a very similar good. comparison uh, early last fall with a different group before I was with Autoblog, obviously. And my conclusion was, for the off-road part, you really can't beat the Gladiator. But like, once you want to get on the road and use it as a more practical truck, there, there's, you know, the Ranger and the Colorado, especially, offer more utility for the money, especially for the money. They also just offer more utility. Period. But like when you're off road and it really matters, you want to be in the gladiator. Another thing I like just from my lifestyle, I always fall back to the Wrangler because it's the SUV, like just layout fits me better. Like, you know, you could do a good weekend trip with the family, you know, and it's just like, I need that enclosed capability versus the, Hey, let's start tying stuff down in the gladiator capability. Mm -hmm. So that's usually where I tend to fall. Um, boy, that, that kind of veered off road into, a uh, a gladiator wrangler <laughs> debate. All right. So let's talk about the cars I've been driving literally 12 hours ago. I was in the Toyota Corolla hatchback, went to get some takeout, went to a brewery somewhat by our, by our house, uh, Griffin claw. You guys might know that. Give them a shout out. It's where we actually did our behind the scenes auto blog show, uh, about a year ago. Uh, just picked up some dinner. I actually, believe it or not, I already had plenty of, uh, gin and griffin claw beer so i just went with the food uh so that was fun they threw it right in the back of the hatch fit great let me tell you that it's kind of actually a narrow area back there to really do anything with this hatchback you got to throw the seats down but uh -huh. for takeout it's supremely useful because you smash the hatch down it kind of catches the bag and your food doesn't fly around and it's yeah. like super useful especially if you're trying to be like socially distant if you will um so that worked out great was totally psyched to get in this thing and realized it's a six-speed manual just somehow i didn't notice that at first when i i had driven it yet uh, it, it arrived just arrived this week and i get in there i'm like sweet i have not driven a stick shift and like i don't know when just because you know the way the car situation has been um just the manuals have not been coming out that much so um yeah that was certainly great it was a pretty good transmission i'll say um yeah. clutch is pretty solid the shifts are a little bit long but not too long um car came in a beautiful shade of blue flame so it's just like a bright kind of almost like hawaiian blue looks great it's got the two liter uh four cylinder which um gives you about 169 horsepower i want to say that's nice it's actually an upgraded engine on other corolla variants so so there's that um had a lot of fun suspension was pretty tight 
It looks cool. Again, it's the hatchback. So I would call this a medium spicy hatch, if you will, like medium, uh -huh. not super spicy. Cause you know, again, we're only talking about, you know, a little under 170 horsepower. The transmission is like agreeable. It'd be a good one to learn how to drive a stick on, to be honest. It's not the one that's going to break your wrists or something. So there's all of that chassis is tight. Steering is, you know, pretty dialed in, but still pretty loose. It's a, like, it's a Corolla, man. You know, like, I don't, I don't want to over index on this just cause I haven't driven a manual transmission, you know, <laughs> springy car in a little bit, but, um, I think no, it, that's totally fair that, that, yeah. that's a, that's a fun little hatchback to drive. Um, surprisingly nimble. Yeah. Um, it's really cute. <laughs> and, um, yeah, that that manual transmission is is is, is decent, uh, especially you know for, if in a car that price. And yes, it's it's very forgiving. It's meant to be forgiving because it's it is going to be um, a lot of people's first manual transmission. Um, you know, it's a lot going to be a lot of uh, drivers' first cars. Um, but uh, but besides that, it's 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 actually pretty good to use. Um, but yeah, fun little car. Uh, I actually, uh, when I was on the Corolla sedan launch, um, I, I think Byron was there too, that we got to do uh, a ride along with Ryan Turk, the, uh, uh, and he was drifting a 1,000 horsepower Corolla hatchback. Um, and, you know, grit in your eyes and smoke in your eyes is about, you know, 9 o'clock in the morning. It was fantastic, but... <laughs> Who needs coffee? It, it it shows what you can do with that um with that little platform um you know you can, you, it's 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 a good starting point for something fun. Uh, I most people just leave it how it is, and that's that's fine. Um, it's actually pretty fun and and you know good enough for your daily duties and won't you know break the bank. So I I like that car. What did you think there, Byron? I didn't realize you were on the launch of it. Yeah, it was fun. That was a uh, the. That was the one they did at that old uh, racetrack in Savannah. Oh, that's uh, amazing! I've heard about that place. Yeah, that's it awesome. Was, it's it's. I don't think it's actually used anymore. And they were uh, we were like on and off part of it. Most of what we were using was the skid pad area, which is where they did all the drifting and everything. But the it was fun, and I mean it's it's a good little car. And again, it was the sedan sedan launch, so we didn't really get much time with the hatchbacks, but they had them there so that you could play around with them a little bit. Um, it is a great little car. It's. It's not quite as good as the Mazda-based Toyotas, but it's pretty close. Yeah, I uh, I would agree with that. I kept thinking to myself, I this is great. If I really wanted a Toyota and I wanted to spice it up, this is probably what I'd do. Otherwise, I would look at other like things. Like I think Mazda has it just a little bit more dialed in with their chassis. Um, Civic, I think, is better, but I mean, so it goes. Um, yeah, I mean, but just in the pecking order, you know, however you want to slice it up, it's a really enjoyable car. Um, it was fun to drive. Great thing to get takeout in. Let me put it that way. It <laughs> seems like it was priced fair, too. I mean, this one uh, was just under $27,000, so that's reasonable. Decent fuel economy, 28 in city, 37 highway. That's not bad. It was actually 168 horsepower. I think I said 169. Um yeah, I just part of me wonders with like who knows what's going on with the economy. Are these cars going to start to come back and you're going to really see significant volume in them? Are we going to start to shift away from SUVs, things like that? Who's to say? But I just remember the last recession. Car companies were obsessed with making small cars. There was once talk that Chrysler was going to sort of trade the Ram like design chassis, if you will, platform. To get access to this like small car that they were going to call the Dodge Hornet, which for them, thankfully, that didn't happen. That would have been a ridiculous trade. I want to say that was with Nissan, uh, if I'm yeah, remembering my car history so. right. Man, that that goes up there with like pick your lopsided baseball trades that didn't happen. That would have been up there. Um, but I don't know. I don't honestly. I don't think no matter how bad the economy gets, people are going to want smaller cars again i think they're just going to want cheaper suvs is probably how it's going yeah. to go we're too far down that road <laughs> yeah and there are so many of them and they're so efficient now i mean the 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 little compact and subcompact 
SUVs and crossovers you can get are just as efficient as most of the small sedans and hatchbacks were in like 2006 and 2007. So there's really not much to lose by going in that route, unfortunately. It's true. It's true. Um... All right, let's move along real quickly to an SUV, a large one that I drove. Uh, did this last weekend, put a good amount of miles on it. It's a Toyota Highlander. Uh, very nice vehicle. It uh, was loaded up. It had a beautiful, um, you know, kind of brownish, orangish interior. Infotainment was good. It had the third row in there, and there was like an okay amount of room, I guess is the way to put it. I, uh, for hauling a bunch of things, I had to drop the seats to really get like, like the amount of room I wanted, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I would say this, it's, it's competitive in the segment. You have so many different three row SUVs you could get right now. Um, I'm not sure I would get this one. I might, I might not. Um, I went on the Highlander launch geez, a few years back at Pebble Beach, Carmel Valley Ranch, if that means anything. <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, it's just, there's so many good ones out there. This one didn't blow me away, but I thought it was very nice. Stickered for about 51.6. So, you know, considering it was pretty loaded up, you know, yeah. that's respectable. You know, that's fine. That's, I mean, literally that's like table stakes for a big SUV these days. Uh, I didn't realize it was built in Princeton, Indiana, just as I was looking at the Monroney. Uh, mine was in platinum trim. That's what I was looking for. That's where I got like all these different, like, you know, very nice, you know, bells and whistles and things in there. The leather was very nice. Um, yeah, I don't know. Has that like V6 that Toyota's been using for a while. Um, all wheel drive, of course. It just, I felt very suburban in it. And, you know, I was hauling things and it was fine. I mean, you know, I liked it. It was comfortable. It's a good car to have. Like, it's a good, okay quarantine car, I guess. If you got to like go haul a bunch of groceries or like stuff like I did, you know, I wouldn't put it at the top of the segment. I wouldn't put it at the bottom. It's just, it's the Highlander, man. That's, that's what it's always been. I don't know if you guys have driven one of these even remotely recently, but that was my take on it. Just, it's like, it's there. It's pretty good. Yeah. I was on the launch for it in uh, December. And, um, you know, you sum, sum it up pretty well. Um, the thing is that there's also the hybrid version and it's not much more and it's, it's way more efficient and it's, um, you know, it has its trade-offs, but I'd argue it's, it's even better to, better to drive. Um, but that said, people buy a ton of these. Yep. Um, yep. I mean, that's just the way it is. There might be better SUVs out there in the segment, but. Toyota will sell a ton of these. Um, let's see. That third row is is pretty small. I I couldn't sit back there. Uh, my it broke my ankles and had my knees, you know, up under my chin. <clears throat> um, they this generation's a few inches, like three inches longer, I think, than the outgoing, and that's all in the in the rear cargo area. So they didn't add any passenger volume to that. So it's a great uh, SUV if you need to carry stuff around and only use that third row very occasionally for you know smaller passengers. It's good to have in a pinch. Um, I wouldn't rely on it as a as a three row vehicle where I'd be using the that third row all the time. I would like. I think that's how a lot of unless you're getting you're stepping up to like a Chevy. Tahoe or like a Yukon, Yukon XL, big body on frame SUVs. I think that's how a lot of like three row crossovers sort of get used. That's how like my family has a GMC Acadia. The third row seats are always down, you know. Um, although there's actually an okay cargo hold back there. I should say that. Like there's a little more room, but or it seems like there is. I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I mean, that's I think a real world use of like a three row crossover if that makes sense is you know you drop the third row maybe you have a car seat in the second row the dog's laying on the floor and then you know the parents are up front and you have you know a couple kids in the middle row um you know and then you just th throw stuff in the back um so yeah i don't know it's probably enough on the highlander i think that's all people need to hear um <laughs> but yeah they sell a ton of them so I'll put the highlander in the headline 
Yeah, right. There you go. <laughs> we talked about the Mach 1 and the Gladiator and this kind of hot hatch, and we have trivia and these other cool features, but Highlander. Um, <laughs> all right, guys. I dreamed this up last weekend when I was doing some cleaning. Um, I'm going to try to stump you with some trivia. And if re uh, readers, I'm... if you guys like this, drop this in the comments. Hit us up on Twitter. If you hate it, we'll, we won't do it again. No, that's a lie. We'll probably do it again until people start to like it. But You got to do it with Joel. Joel would be amazing on this. By Byron's going to be good. Byron's going to be but good. Don't uh, stop. Don't Zach, do that. Zach would be good too. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just the worst at any kind of trivia all right. at all. <laughs> all right. Well, there's only five questions. Um, right. It's only 10.04 Eastern time, so you probably don't want to open a beer at this point, but I guess it's trivia. So I'm ordering yeah. some nachos right now. Yeah, there you go. All right. <laughs> These are very Greg trivia questions too. They're like kind of Italian based. They're historic. Somebody else would come up with one that might form like fall more into your, your realm. I don't know. Let's just do it. Uh, what team won the first formula one race? I don't know. My, uh, my gut says Mercedes, but I, I don't even, God. Yeah, I don't know. Byron, you want Byron? to take a guess? I'm going to go Alpha. Correct. Oh. Boom. With Nino Farina at the wheel. Um, 1950. I Alpha should have stuck with the Italian clue. I should have, <laughs> yeah. I should have applied that to this. Yeah, well, yeah, Ferrari yeah. felt too obvious, so. Yeah. Okay, so one nothing Byron. What team holds the most constructors titles in Formula One? There's a couple choices here. It may or may not be the obvious, although maybe you don't don't know what the obvious one is. Ferrari? Byron, you want to take a guess? Mercedes. Boom! Snyder comes back and evens the there score. The obvious one. Go with the Italian. <laughs> Ferrari has 16. Um yeah, they're like the Montreal Canadiens, the New York Yankees of Formula One. Uh, I'll give you this, John, the Michigan football, the all-time winningest program in their sport. There you go. <laughs> uh, John's a proud U of M alumni. Uh, go Blue. Let's see. What else do we have here? Uh, okay, moving along. Cadillac and Lincoln were founded by the same dude. Name him. If either one of you gets this, this is going to be impressive. Byron, I think you know this. Like, this is like a Byron thing that yeah, you would know. I should have this. It's not a household name, so I'm really... There yeah. would have been a fair way to... John, you want to take a guess while Byron's... Guess. Um, Albert Einstein. <laughs> That's how my hair looks right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, there was a time when I knew this, like for certain knew this, and I've lost it. Henry Leland... There we go. Uh, He's not a household name, but I mean, when you think about it, this guy founded Cadillac and Lincoln. Yeah. That's like kind of amazing. Yeah. Um, there is a street in Detroit that used to have a couple of good bars on it named Leland. Uh, yeah. And there's like a theater or a restaurant. I can't think of which one it is, but I can picture like the marquee. It's pretty cool. All right, moving along. Two to go. And the score is, I believe, one nothing. No, one to one. So... Toyota's first car sold in the United States was uh, what's the Corolla? Byron? Byron's thinking real high. Yeah, I see the gears oh, in his head. I don't like it. He knows it. Um, he knows it. I'm going to throw this guess out there. It's going to be wrong, but I'm going to say the Corona. The oh. Corona. Okay. All right, guys. You've actually, I don't want to say I'm stumped here. I have it written down, but I need to fact check it. I thought I had this, uh, but now I'm like double checking my source here. <laughs> Let me double check this. I had this. So we've got Corona and the Corona. That's what we're, we're guessing. Corolla and Corona. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, you're both wrong. It's the Toyota yeah. Pet. Um, oh. 1958. I knew it, but I also, like, you had me, like, I was get, going into some doubt there. I'm like, wait a minute, maybe yeah. I, I went the wrong, God, wrong I route. 
but this is actually on the historical page of Toyota, which is was my original source. 1958. That's, that's a good one. They only yeah, sold good, it until really 61. So. That's a Joel. Joel would have had that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there's like two or three that are pretty early. The Land Cruiser, um, you know, was around pretty close then, but it looks like they're they're saying the Toyota Pet was the first one because they sold 287 Toyota Pet sedans. I guess I would accept they sold one Land Cruiser. So I don't know if it was the first thing they sold ahead of those 287, but either way, got it wrong. Sounds like I kind of got it wrong too, ish. Uh, there we go. Boy, the commenters are going to light us up on these. They're going to be like, <laughs> <laughs> like they're going to be like, Greg, are experts. Yeah, you're experts, and then they'll be like, Greg, actually, you got this one wrong. Which actually, I hope you do. I'm kind of doing this to try to get people to comment. So, let's do it. Uh, lastly, Volkswagen had a plant in the United States from 1978 until 1987. In what state was it located? I know this. Byron one. knows it. Go, go ahead, Pennsylvania. Byron. John. Well, I'm gonna go with what Byron said. Oh man, <laughs> I should have had like more of a double blind here, but uh, <laughs> you both got it right. So by my count, you got it's a two-two tie. We've got John won. Byron got Alpha. John got Ferrari uh, in order for answers. Nobody got Henry Leland or the Toyota Toya Pet. And then you both got Pennsylvania two two tie. I've got I've got who who is the name of the, what was the name of that guy Greg? He had a house like in Ann Arbor. That was he, he worked for Ford. He was like like a a skull crusher dude. Harry Bennett. Um, yeah. 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 What trivia question but, was that? Just <laughs> oh, I, I just I'm, I'm just, just gonna bring up this a, crazy a, like that was just something you could you would know. That would be I, a good I, one. Yeah. I was driving by trying to find that guy's house, <laughs> but I don't think I don't I don't think you can see it from the road. But he had like tiger or lions and stuff in his house. That's crazy. Guy was a nutball. I'm but, actually reading a book right now. Uh, it's taking me forever to get through. It's called like something like Terror in the Motor City. It's about how there was this like crazy like like just terror organization um, in the 30s, like that just was like you know going crazy throughout Detroit. And it was set against the backdrop of the Tigers, Red Wings, and Lions all won titles in like 1935, I want to say. Huh. And <laughs> so just like a lot of the people were involved and Harry Bennett was in there because he was like this big Tigers fan. He was like, I don't know, somewhat involved with the gang. Um, yeah, that's that's a didn't see a 10, 12 on Friday morning, a Harry Bennett reference flying at me. <laughs> Where's his house in Ann Arbor, John? I didn't know he had a place down here. It's um, it's by the river. It's on the river. I mean, somewhere. that's probably it's, convenient for a guy who. It's like off. Of, it's off of Getty's. I two. think um, it's off of Getty's somewhere. I actually went to his, uh, like up north cottage. Um, I want to say it's near Grayling or Kalkaska in Michigan, and it was crazy. I was in the Scouts. We like camped on this like campground where it was sort of the land and the tables flipped over and the machine guns would go in the table there was like <laughs> in the hallways there was always like knives and axes and like whatever he had a see-through swimming pool so he could like stare at people through a swimming pool because in addition to being a thug he was a pervert um <laughs> okay. guy was a maniac he, he literally this dude was a maniac and this was the question i was looking for from you <laughs> yeah you know what <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. You really, um, you really loaded up. Uh, you took trivia to a new level here. This yeah, was, no kidding. <laughs> this was like, yeah, Uber trivia. Yeah. Cool. On that note, um, let's move along. I had this other part. I threw in the uh, the feature section here. We're actually doing pretty good okay on time. So um, I want to know from both you guys, best car. I guess we'll call it trivia tie for now. Two, two, and one. And then you guys each get two, and then we just randomly discussed Harry Bennett, which is like, I guess I'll take the point on that. So uh, two, two, and one, it's like a weird hockey score. Uh, oh, you, and you get a point for being, the, for being the boss of it, too, for being the host. There we uh, go. There we go. You knew all the right answers. <laughs> I think I did, yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, car movies. 
best car movie to watch during quarantine, although just whatever is also fine. And I actually put in the line here, best car or best cars. So if you want to nominate one of the three Disney Pixars, that's great. Or just what's your favorite car movie that maybe you're binging during this odd time in the history of the world. I'm going for uh, some lighthearted movies. Uh, need to laugh. And so there have been, there, there are two that I've, that I've been watching. Um, been watching Talladega, Talladega Nights. Yes. Mm. Uh, oh, just, love it. It's, it's just hilarious. And then, you know, we've been playing, um, you know, NASCAR Heat 4 on the stream. I haven't been playing, but, but Autoblog has been playing. And um, that is such a fun game. And, like, it just, every time I play that or watch Eric play it, it just makes me want to watch Talladega Nights again. He even named his character Ricky Bobby. Um, it's just fantastic. It's just racing taken to uh, the most absurd. And... Um, God, I love uh, Sasha Baron Cohen in it, too. He's so hilarious. good. The other one, the other movie that I always come back to, um, you know, Quarantine or Not, and it's not totally a car movie, but there's a lot of cars in it, and, like, there's a lot of wrecked cars in it, is Blues Brothers. Okay? Yeah, that's it's true. My, yeah. That's a car. One of my uh, all-time yeah. favorite movies That's ever. a car movie. Yeah. One of my all-time favorite movies ever, and I could just watch it over and over and over. And um, yeah, the the mall scene, the the <laughs> the the chase scene where you know just tons and tons and tons of cop cars getting flipped over. It's just the best. I love it. Byron, how about you, man? What are you all what right. are you binging, or what's your favorite car movie? Um, my put it in. I can watch any time. Car movie is Rush. Uh, mm, yeah. it, it was so well done and the acting in it is just phenomenal and the cinematography is phenomenal if you have like a home theater system or like a really good set of, of headphones it's the the sounds that come out of that thing are just phenomenal um, that oh, Talladega Nights is such a good answer I'm a little angry I actually really enjoy um, on that same kind of line of thinking I, I enjoy watching Days of Thunder it's, I mean, you know, it's Top Gun on pavement, and that's all you really uh-huh. need. It's so yeah. good, dumb, fun, just ridiculous. Everybody in that is ridiculous in the best possible way. Like, Carrie Always, in some ways, is almost a little bit Sasha Baron Cohen in that movie by accident. Not even like he's intentionally trying to be, like, over the top. It just worked. It's, <laughs> like, good, bad in the best possible way. Cool. I uh, what actually got me thinking on this topic here was I've been binge watching Cars with my son. He gets up mm-hmm. pretty early, and we will do a lot of like early morning like movie sessions. Like you try to limit screen time, but if it's like the sun's barely up, I don't really count that. I think it's totally fine. Um, <laughs> I will say this from a car movie perspective: there's a million out there. I actually just started Senna, but. This is going to sound so good. It is good, but I feel like it's a little slow. I'm going to take like the, the counterpoint here. Like, I know you guys are probably like, Greg, you're crazy. You're, what do you, you don't like Senna? It's not that, but it's a little slow to watch at like 10 or 11 at night. I'm going to say that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. I I was curious if you were (laughs) going to like take my head off there and, uh, but it's, it's good so far. So I'm liking that. And then best movie from the Pixar studios is I'm going to say one because it's so iconic and Paul Newman has a significant role in it and I think he's such a great actor uh, I was actually at Auto Week when he died and I remember I was I pulled together his obit it's under a staff byline actually but um, uh, and some of the reaction to it but that was cool um, yeah I we just, were talking he, about this a little we were talking about this a little bit on the stream um uh, cars. Uh, I've only seen I think Cars three all the way through. Okay. Uh, and I didn't know that about Cars one. I didn't know Paul Newman was in it until Doc Hudson you know, just dude. last week. And so I gotta, I gotta, I gotta watch it. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's it's really good. It's, it's a really fun movie. Yeah, it it really sets the tone. I think it has the best narrative. Um, it's kind of a pretty movie to watch from like just like an an animation Pixar perspective. 
Yeah, there's yeah. so many good little like Easter eggs in it for car people, like the the drive-in that they have, the lights light up and the firing order of an old yeah. Ford V8. Like, there's lots of cool, just little really subtle things. Also, it touches on like Americana nostalgia, like the Route 66 bypasses and all that. Like how car culture has changed over the the decades. It's really cool. It's a it's a very satisfying movie. I would say it's head and shoulders above Cars 2, which is just like the just like the stereotypical sequel. It's crazy. There's all these different characters in it. Cars 2 is basically a Bond movie with, it's like it's long, like Owen Wilson, who's like Lightning McQueen, is barely in it. It's just like, <laughs> it seems like it needed more editing than it got, I mean, to be the film critic here. It's, it's glitzy. If you like, like just looking at cars, it's great from that perspective. There's all kinds of different, like, you know, animated cars in it. And then three, they pull it back. They kind of close the loop. They pass the torch. Uh, they have some like unused like footage of Paul Newman, if you will, in it, which is cool. Which lets Doc Hudson, the character, be back in it. It sounds like they put down some tracks like just ahead of time. Um, mm -hmm. So ten years later, he's in this movie that came out like just a couple years ago, which is awesome. Yeah, that's my random thing. That's what's going on in my life is cars right now. <laughs> Speaking of Paul Newman, if you need another quarantine watch and you haven't seen it yet, there's a documentary based on a book uh, called The Racing Life of Paul Newman. I believe it's on Ooh, Prime. Cool. I think it's included with Prime. But it talks about Paul Newman just as an amateur turned semi-pro racing driver and the people he touched and the people who came into the sport because of him who didn't even really – like they knew who he was obviously because of his Hollywood persona – but the people who met him only as a race car driver, usually at Lime Rock in Connecticut, like just hanging out one of the guys in the paddock. It's, it's, it's a really good story. I will add that to my list. That sounds awesome. He raced under the, like the pseudonym PL Newman and he like never put on airs. And if you're wearing a helmet half the time, you know, maybe you might not even notice just cause that, unless you're like one, a car guy and two, a film buff, everybody knows who Paul Newman is, was, but you just, you see like some probably gray haired, tall dude walking the pits. You might not put it together. So I think that's super yeah. cool the way he handled himself. He came to racing relatively late in life too. Um, right. like in his, like, I think thirties or forties even did it right up until like, like basically he died. Um, he, there's a great quote and I'll paraphrase it where he said, racing is the only thing that I ever had any grace in, which is like ridiculous when you consider he's one of the greatest <laughs> actors of the 20th yeah. century. But yeah. Yeah, he got into it because he was learning to race or learning to drive for film. Like, to, it was a movie he was doing with Redford, I think, um, after Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And he just, like, really took to it, fell in love with it. And actually, like, he said later in life that he identified more as a race car driver than he did as an actor, which, like, going back to your point there, Greg, it's just, it says so much about who he was as a person. Because to. The vast majority of people on Earth, he's a Hollywood superstar, or was a Hollywood superstar, but he didn't see himself that way, and that's pretty charming. I need to get to Lime Rock, too. Uh, that is, that's on the bucket list. Uh, I've only hit a few of those sort of like East Coast tracks. Monticello is one. We're, I was just talking about that this morning with somebody else, but man, I want to get to Lime Rock. That is totally on the bucket list. Um, cool. All right, so we're going to wrap things up here. Well, a couple things here. Uh... Best orphan car brand. I just figured with you two, make your case, put it out there. What's a brand that you wish was still here that you think was unjustly killed off, has the greatest history? I don't care how you justify it. Pick one and justify it. Let's go with you, Byron, because I know what John's going to be. Yeah, so. well, I, I think we're both going for GM here because I'm going to okay. say Pontiac. Pontiac died right when it was about to be great again. Like, it was it was right on that cusp. They had fantastic enthusiast products. They were poised to be the fun brand from GM. It was all really coming together, and then it wasn't anymore. And so, like, Pontiac and then, by extension, Holden, just to kind of bring it together, since that's where a lot of the good product was coming from. But John's going to dominate this one, so I'm going to hand it off. Yeah, if <laughs> you guys can see what John's wearing. John, what are you wearing right now? I'm wearing my uh, 442 shirt. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, yeah, old. I'm Oldsmobile. <laughs> um, such a storied history. Uh, you know, a hundred years of car making. 
um, and just so many wonderful, wonderful cars, you know, from the, you know, the wheeled stagecoaches, I mean, the, the motorized stagecoaches to, um, you know, even the, the cutlasses of, of the 80s uh, <laughs> were pretty good. Um, uh, yeah, I, that's the one I miss the most, of, of course. But, um, but man, I'd really like to see what Packard would be doing if they had, uh, if they were still around now. What would a Packard look like? I, I, ca- I kind of imagine it to be like what Cadillac wants to be if it you know, wasn't reskinned uh, Chevys. <laughs> um, like ultimate American luxury. Um, yeah. So I, I got to go with Oldsmobile because, and then, um, I don't know. Packard, I just, I, I think it's just such an interesting brand, such be- beautiful, beautiful cars, uh, and I, I'd just be really curious as as, where, as to where they'd be right now. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. I, I mean, I love Oldsmobile. I think I will say this. I think from a like a practical pers- practical perspective, I can kind of see why GM made the call on both those. I mean, actually, I can't. I could totally see why they made the call on that on killing those off, given the position they were in just like, Oh the, yeah. The products were good from an enthusiast perspective. Yeah. Not so much Oldsmobile by the time they killed it off, but like prior, yeah. like basically right up until that point, they were great. But I will say this. I think the Aurora was an underrated car. Um, love all those cutlasses. I was a big Pontiac fan too. My brother had a grand Prix and was talking about get upgrading to like a, the GXP version, uh, but then he decided he didn't want that kind of like crazy power to the front wheels. Um, so then he later got like an Impala SS with that small block through and three horsepower um, engine in it. Just total random GM, literally GM, as in me trivia too. But so, I, but now that I've like sort of dinged the practicality of your brands, I'm going to go even more less practical and say Hudson. I think is the underrated like brand that i don't think bringing it back would work this is a brand that like they have like a car that you consider and obviously i'm in this cars phase in my life doc hudson paul newman the hudson hornet um but i do think that's a great brand they made some great cars they dominated nascar um in the early 50s um even requiring some like rule changes because their cars were just so capable um it's an iconic design i'm just going to say i think it's it's a little bit of one that's lost to history um, that I think really achieved a ton and maybe they're like the ultimate brand that it's like better to burn out than fade away, you know, Um, you know, leave it there. I mean, could there be a Hudson today? No, probably not just because like, you know, I mean like when people talk about the past and sometimes the past is prologue, if you will, but like, there is no modern version of Hudson. You could bring it back and people would be like, what's a Hudson? That's like this old school name. The iconic image of it is the Hornet. You know, I mean, the styling, the last vis- like vision of it anybody would have in their head is from cars or from the 50s. Like, there's no practical way forward to re- re-bring back Hudson for any modern thing. Uh, but I love them. The style's amazing. I've recently gotten more into the history I think my kid has a Hudson Hornet Hot Wheel or something like that around here. That's my vote. I'm bummed that there's, you know, not going to be, probably not going to be uh, an Ipsy Orphans car show. Yeah. Um, They have the Orphans car show here in Ipsilanti every year. And it's, um, you know, out at the waterfront park, Riverside Park. And um, just all these people who just have these beautiful old orphan brand cars in their garages, bring them out and they're sectioned off. Uh, it's a giant park and you can walk around and talk to all the owners. And it's just a, it's a really fun car show. And then, and then they judge each category too. Um, I was actually a judge last year. Nice. And so that, that was really fun, but it's just such a wonderful car show to help the, the, you know, historical society right there in Ipsy. Um, where there, it's a small little museum, but they've got some cool stuff in there. Um, but yeah, that's that is a wonderful show. It's and one of my favorite shows, actually. Agree yeah. with you. 
they do a beer fest too, beer like festival sometime. Yeah, at that park that's yeah. been canceled this year too. Yeah, which is, Jeez. it sucks because that's a great that's a great fest. <laughs> a couple of good Ipsy events. I actually did my undergrad at Eastern Michigan in Ypsilanti. Uh, a lot of good brewers out there. Um, yeah, yeah, that museum's pretty amazing too. It's um, it's not big, but it's very cool. And one thing I like about that show is the vibe about it. Like you go out there and you can see all these obscure, sometimes very highfalutin, sometimes not cars. Uh-huh. But it's so accessible. It's like yeah. you can get stuff that you might not even see anywhere but Pebble Beach. But it's also just this chill, you know, Metro Detroit, Michigan vibe. You know, like mm-hmm. like I said, you go to a brewery. It's not expensive. It it's like you could see some amazing things, but the vibe is the antithesis of Pebble Beach in some ways. Yeah. So for sure. Which is yeah, I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying it's it's a cool vibe. And you don't have to be like dressed up to go. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. Should we spend some money? Let's do it. Yeah. All right. Somebody wrote to me from The Hague. This is the first time I've ever received to spend my money from there. Or is it The Hog? <laughs> you guys tell me. I think it's The, the Hague. Hague. I believe yeah, it's The yeah. Hague. Yeah. The Hague. Uh, first time, yeah. Uh, big fan of Autoblog. Um, compliments us for all our efforts. Thank you. Uh, in the Netherlands, due to tax incentives, a lot of people drive EVs. Um, a lot of different things he's working through here. But over the course of this year, he wants to trade in his Mercedes C350E Hybrid, which is a cool car, actually, for a full electric vehicle. The following choices are the Volvo XC40 Recharge, as he calls it, e-tron 50 Quattro, Tesla Model Y, or Mustang Mustang Mach-E. He wrote Mustang E. Uh, Ford would probably cringe at that. But it's the Mach-E is what they're calling it. Uh, here's the criteria, which I love. Two wild boxer dogs that he's got to carry. And uh, yeah, the writer, his name was Boss. So hopefully I got all my pronunciations right there. Down a quart of coffee. John, let's start with you, Mr. Green Car Editor Extraordinaire. Well, the dogs are the thing that, that are throwing me for a loop here. Um, I, these are all, all great. I, w- I would drive any one of them. I, I would shy away from the Model Y just because there's going to be a ton of them. There's probably going to be issues with it. (laughs) Um, I want to say the Mustang, uh, Mach E because that's just going to be awesome. But I don't know that that's going to have the space that you need. The XC 40 is very compact. Um, but, uh, it's, it's packaged very nicely. And that might be the one I go with. Um, the e-tron is, you know, that's, that's, that's really, that's tough because it's, it's fantastic, you know, and it has, it has the, it has the space. I'd be worried about the dogs, uh, messing it up. Shredding the nice Audi seats. Yeah, although I mean it's it's built pretty well. Um depends on how you want to carry your dogs. If you have them strapped into seats, yeah, maybe the the Etron. Uh, if you're putting them in cages in the back, Etron. Um if they're just going to run loose, I'm going with the with the Volvo. Um It's 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 packaged well. There's l- lots of room you can put dogs and other stuff in there. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, I feel like that interior will hold up depending on the, uh, upholstery you choose. They have, they have a wide range of, of upholsteries. Um, I like some of those, those city weaves. Um, if you, if you, if you can hack it though, the e-tron is, is a fabulous vehicle. I'm going with e-tron. 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 Okay. Bye. <laughs> well, John basically took the exact same path that i was thinking like he eliminated them in the exact same order i would have um so yeah actually i like the e-tron choice i want to throw one more out there though that isn't on the list and as a a, since boss is a mercedes owner i'm assuming yeah he left the eqc off for a reason perhaps but if he didn't i think he should consider that because i mean for the footprint the format i mean it's a it's basically a, a glc that isn't glc like it's a little bit bigger than the XC40. 
Um, and the hatch area is pretty useful, so for the dogs, that seems like it would be at least as practical as the e-tron. So, between the two of those, I don't know which one I would necessarily pick, but they both seem viable. Yeah, that, at that point, it comes down to a, to a, a personal taste issue exactly. between those two. Yeah, and he may have a reason for not wanting to purchase another Mercedes, so I'm not gonna like I'm not trying to pressure anybody to do something they don't want to do. But I'm just throwing but it out there. But if you like your Mercedes, yeah. check that out for sure. Yeah, why not, right? Very cool. Yeah. Um, my, I'd say with your head, go with maybe the Volvo. If you're going to go with your heart, go with the Mustang. Um, just because that'd be awesome. It's going to be tight. But I mean, I don't know. My dog and her transportation, and she's a golden retriever, so she's pretty big. Uh, but it's always a work in progress depending on like if she's in our car, what press car she's in. Sometimes she rides shotgun. Sometimes she's in the backseat. Sometimes she lays on the floor. Uh, sometimes she drives. I'm kidding. She doesn't. But my <laughs> point is, is you're going to figure it out with the dog. Unless you have this like system. I know some people do have those very official things they use. And that's, that's great. If that's how you want to do it. And two dogs, I'll admit, that's, that, that there is a degree of challenge in there. But I would probably land on the Mach-E. I do love the e-tron, though. That's a brilliant car. Uh, I would definitely at least consider that one you know that's those would be the two emotional picks for me volvo's great it's definitely a stylish play but it wouldn't be the car that i'd be like fired up to wake up and be like we're gonna go drive the xc40 today you know I, i'd just be that would be more of my microwave car but i do like volvos i'll say that yeah i don't really know i'd fall on the tesla model y uh kind of with with you john like nah, maybe i don't know it's gonna be tough to get to um could be tough to get them let's put it that way so, yeah, it'll be tough to get them at first, and then after a while, they'll be everywhere, and it'll be tough to get them serviced. <laughs> I would say it's not worth waiting for either. I'm not totally yeah. up on the production cadence of Tesla at this like exact moment, this minute, Friday, <laughs> uh, May 29th, but um, you'll have no problems with like the Ford or the Audi or the Volvo, um, just getting one, getting them serviced, like... You're not going to have to look to find a Ford dealer or a Volvo dealer or an Audi dealer, most likely. So there's all of those things. Um, yeah, I think that's where I'd land. Mach-E and then close second is the Audi. All right, guys. Good cool. show. Uh, this is a lot of fun. We covered a gazillion things. Hope your quarantine's treating you well. Any final thoughts? Um. I've I've got some uh, I've got some questions brewing um, for for trivia. If you want ones to throw at other people, um, let's do it. So I will I will send those along to you. And I sh I should have known Leland. I should have known that one. Yeah, that's that one's gonna haunt me. <laughs> that's gonna haunt you. Is Henry Leland specifically gonna haunt you? My buddy Hank. Yeah. Uh, it's just <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. Well. So it goes. I think uh, maybe you can haunt you in the historic Leland Hotel built in 1927 in Detroit on Bagley <laughs> Avenue. How about that? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> there we go. We're going to end with that. You got a good deal of trivia. Sounds like at least the hosts enjoyed it. So we'll, we'll do it a couple more times. See if we can stump our readers. Everybody be safe out there. Uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>